Well, good evening, and may I add my very warm welcome to you if you've arrived recently. My name's William. I'm the rector of the church here, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you if you are joining us uh, for the very first time or um, for the thousandth time. It's a great time of year as people arrive. I was sitting next to somebody who joined us for the first time three years ago, and she said somebody had actually brought her for the first few weeks. I think that's a very kind thing to do. If you've got a friend, actually, to come with them, that's, that's a great thing to do. Well, now, um, we're starting a series that's going to run right through till the beginning of December, God willing, in the book of Acts. Um, and so we're in Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Back in 2001, about 13 years ago, a guy called Dr. Callum Brown uh, wrote this book, The Death of Christian Britain. And it centered on the decline and the decay of institutional religion in Britain. And he charted its decline right the way through the 20th century. And Dr. Brown's book, uh, with its very pessimistic look at the nature of institutional religion in Britain, was was of a piece with a whole string of other books that came out around the turn of the millennium. Uh, There was this book, I bought several of them, Ludovic Kennedy, All in the Mind, a real old atheist, Ludovic Kennedy, uh, A. N. Wilson, God's Funeral, all talk of Christian Britain is over. It's gone. And of course, there was some truth, and is some truth, in what they were saying. Because all really that was left in institutional religion in this country uh, was largely uh, form, uh, and or rather was uh, rather style, all substance and all form had long since departed. However, if you're here as a true Christian, you will know that the living church, where the substance of the gospel is still, still taught, is absolutely alive. And uh, whether you've been in a church somewhere else or here, you will know that the Christian faith is very much alive and kicking in this country and that Christ is building his church. And therefore, we find ourselves in Britain and in London today in a situation that I think is remarkably similar to the situation into which Luke wrote this book of Acts. You can see from verse 1 that he's writing to Theophilus and that this is volume 2 of a two-volume work. And therefore, uh, Luke wrote Luke's Gospel, Uh, and the book of Acts. He wrote over 25% of the New Testament. He wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. And in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, he tells us what his aim is in producing this two volumes. It is that the reader might have certainty concerning the things that we've been taught. And the certainty, I think, uh, focuses around two or three areas. First, he defines the gospel so that we can be clear what the gospel is. What is the true message of Jesus Christ? Then we find him all the way through Luke and Acts defending the gospel, both historically, this is historical real truth, and in a culture. This is not bad for society, the Christian faith, uh, even when people are so hostile to it and reject it. And we find Luke seeking to see the gospel declared to the ends of the earth. Now, there is no doubt in Britain today that we live in a country where the gospel needs to be defined. I became a Christian back in 1979. Um, I'd called myself a Christian previously, but I wasn't. And as I came to the Bible and came to the true Christian faith, I realized that everything I thought I knew about Jesus, which was precious little, was largely wrong. And since 1979, the kind of residual knowledge of Jesus in our culture has uh, considerably decreased. And therefore, the gospel needs to be defined again. And Luke Acts does that for us. Similarly, the gospel needs to be defended. I mean, you will know that more than anybody else, because in your workplace and in your college and uh, wherever you find yourself in London, you will find there are people who not only think that the Christian gospel is historical gobbledygook, um, but also that the Christian gospel is bad for society, you bigot, you, you fundamentalist. And therefore we're going to find Luke 
both defining and defending the gospel as we work our way through Acts uh, up to December, and then maybe in a few years to come as we work on through other chapters. But also we live in an age where the gospel needs to be re-declared, if you like, all over again uh, to our country. Well, let's get straight down to business. And I want us to see from the first five verses that the central hero of this book is Jesus. And that is spelt out for us in verses 1 to 5, where we find the star character, verses 1 and 2, his unique historic achievements, verse 3, and the life-changing gift he offers in verse 4 and 5. On the back of your service sheet, you'll have uh, a, 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 an outline of the talk. Well, actually, you have a blank sheet of paper. Um, that is my fault. You know, deadlines, one doesn't always quite reach them and all that sort of stuff. So I didn't, confession. But do take notes. It'd be quite good, wouldn't it, to build up your own set of notes on the Book of Acts as we work through. And so our first heading, point one, the central hero of this book is King Jesus. 1A, he is the star character, verses 1 and 2. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Notice that word began. This tells us that the subject of this second volume is going to be the ongoing work of Jesus. So in volume one, Dr. Luke systematically presented all that Jesus began to do and teach as Jesus established his kingly rule through his work on earth. And volume one ended, as you can see, with Jesus carefully commissioning specific apostles as divinely appointed eyewitnesses. They were chosen by him. And now in volume two, we're going to be told what Jesus continues to do as he rules from heaven in his physical absence. So volume one, kingdom established. Volume two, kingdom extended as Jesus rules from heaven. And it would be too easy, wouldn't it, to think that Jesus is no longer the hero of this book. That somehow it's all about the apostles, as people have called it. It was given this name quite late on, second, third century, Acts of the Apostles. But actually, verse 1 tells us Jesus is the hero. All too easy to think that actually the Holy Spirit is the hero. Well, there's a huge amount about the Holy Spirit. We're going to be coming to it. Gloriously exciting and wonderful, the third person of the Trinity. But verse 1 tells us that actually Jesus is the hero of this book. And that key word began tells us that Jesus remains front and center, the star character. The whole series, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And if you find any of us preachers getting off the core subject of Jesus sometime in mid-November, come up and tell us, won't you? Call us to account. This book's supposed to be about Jesus. You're talking about something else. Get back on track, William. I'd love you to do that if I get off track. Verse 3 tells us then of his unique historic achievement. There is point 1b. 1a, star character, 1b, historic achievement. Verse 3. To them, the apostles, he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. He suffered on the cross in accordance with God's promise to carry God's judgment at our sin. He defeated death in accordance with God's promise that his anointed ruler would reign forever. He rose again, and through his death-defeating resurrection, he established his kingly rule, the kingdom of God. Sin is paid for, death is conquered, evil is destroyed, eternity is opened up to those who follow Jesus. And do you notice there, in verse 3, he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs? In the old authorized version, which is a very ancient translation which nobody here will remember, but in the old authorized version, it was translated by many infallible proofs. It's a very strong word, but actually, infallible proof is saying the same thing twice, so we just have by many proofs. And once again, we could go back to Luke's Gospel to Volume 1 and look at the resurrection appearances of Jesus. If you know Luke chapter 24, there Luke establishes for us very clearly that the dead, the earthly corpse of Jesus was definitely dead. 
that the occupied tomb of Jesus was certainly empty and that the physical body of Jesus was undeniably raised. He showed himself to him. He established that he was alive, that he defeated death by many infallible proofs. He appeared to his disciples on the road to Emmaus. He instructed and taught them. He ate with them. They touched him. He ate a piece of fish. There were teeth marks in it. And he taught them on the road to Emmaus. The central character, Jesus, the unique historic achievement, his suffering, death, and resurrection. And then verses 4 and 5, his life-changing gift. Just glance down at these verses. While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now again, right back at the start of Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, John the Baptist came baptizing with water, but, he, but basically he said, all I can do is get you wet. A far greater one than me is coming. One who will be able to wash your sins away so that as a cleansed vessel, God the Holy Spirit will be able to enter into your life and give you a whole new, fresh start. That is baptism with the Spirit, which is a conversion experience. As someone comes to Jesus, has their sins washed clean through his death on the cross, and as God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, enters right into the life of a person so that if you follow Jesus, if you've turned to him and been forgiven of your sins, you have been baptized in the Spirit, God himself dwells within you. And as you start your week next week in a new halls of residence, or a new office, or as you do whatever you do tomorrow morning as you get up, God is living in you. Now I wonder if you can see what Dr. Luke has achieved by this brilliant introduction. It's a volume two, isn't it? And that's what volume twos do, you know. Uh, Harry never trusted the muggles and always felt more at home in Hogwarts. Well, you know exactly where you are, unless you've been on Mars for the last five years. You're in the Philosopher's Pebble or something like that, whatever it happens to be, and uh, so you're on track. But this is far greater than that, isn't it? Notice a couple of things. First, it corrects our understanding of this volume two. Some have been told this is the Acts of the Apostles. Well, it didn't originally come with that title. Others may have been told it's the Acts of the Spirit. Well, it's not really. The apostles are key players. The Spirit is the life-changing gift, and he enables God's power to enter into it. But the real title of this book is the ongoing work of Jesus as he rules from heaven and as his word and kingly rule advances across the world. Volume 1 kingdom established. Volume 2, kingdom extended through the powerful advance of the gospel of Jesus. It's not volume 1, the history of Jesus, volume 2, the history of the church. Not volume 1, the story of Jesus, volume 2, the story of the church. Not volume 1, the acts of Jesus, volume 2, the acts of the apostles. But volume 1, the reign of Jesus established. Volume 2, the reign of Jesus is extended. And then the second thing that this wonderful introduction does for us, he reminds us of the gospel. It's all there, isn't it? Jesus, the star character. His death and resurrection, his kingly rule established, the historic achievement. God dwelling within you, the glorious gift. So it's possible to arrive up in London, isn't it, and find oneself somewhat to have lost focus Ah, there are a thousand voices in London. The Christian faith is all about Jesus. Jesus at the center. Possible to arrive in London wondering, well, I know all that Christian stuff when I was at university. Is that really for the world of work? Mum and dad at home, brothers and sisters, I know all that stuff about Jesus works there. Is it really for London? And here we're reminded not only of the star character, but also of the historic achievement. Jesus Christ died, rose, is enthroned, 
he rules and his kingdom is being extended in London just as it is wherever you've come from and possible to arrive in London somewhat unnerved am I gonna survive it's quite a hostile city sometimes isn't it the glorious gift of God dwelling in your heart so that wherever you are tomorrow morning however much you might feel in a minority the, that glorious gift the Holy Spirit dwelling within well let's move on quickly otherwise we'll run short on time and we'll never get to the end of chapter 1 by December so verses 6 to 8 show us the core curriculum and the core curriculum is the global advance of his kingdom just look at verses 6 to 8 and you will see that it spells out both what the agenda is not and what the agenda is verse 6 when they come together they asked him Lord will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel he said to them it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth now both these things are important both what the agenda is not and what the agenda is and the Apostles make the mistake that has been repeated down through the history of the Christian Church there in verses 6 and 7 Lord will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel you can understand why they wanted it They'd seen King Jesus, and he promised them this glorious kingdom. Is it going to happen now in Israel, for us, today? And that desire for the kingdom of Jesus to come here and now, in this particular place, at this particular time, has dominated Christian disciples down through the centuries. And today you'll find people making the same mistake, thinking that we are on earth to build the kingdom, if you like. To establish the kingdom in my office tomorrow or here in London in this decade at my great my grandparents um, were what is known as British Israelites I'm led to believe I see somebody nodding out there maybe they're a British Israelite as well I doubt it but the British Israelites believed that the English or the British rather were the lost tribe of Israel and that God was going to establish his kingdom across the world through us and I see some of you who have experienced British uh, uh, attempts to do that around the world uh, laughing rather cynically at the idea of the, uh, the, the, the British Empire and so forth some have even suggested that much of America's policy in the Middle East has been driven by a sort of Zionist agenda that God is going to establish his kingdom in Israel today but do you notice Jesus corrects that your job is not uh, to build the kingdom in your workplace but to proclaim the kingdom Lord will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel it's not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth so the agenda now is not restoration or transformation it is proclamation the Apostles are not told that they will inaugurate the kingdom but they are to announce the kingdom and verse 8 is absolutely key because it gives us our core curriculum Jesus remains the hero you will be my witnesses the Apostles are the key players you will be my witnesses and the Holy Spirit is the absolutely essential empowerer you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you but the core curriculum is heralding the unique historic achievement of Jesus and announcing his life-changing gift his kingdom has been established he has been crowned King and he has made it possible for you to enter his kingdom by the work of his Holy Spirit now once again you will find uh, people who want to make verse 8 primarily about you and me and if I had a tenor for every time I've heard these verses taken and t used as a kind of beat up um, you will be my witnesses so we must all go off and so on and so forth 
uh, and applying them first and foremost to us, I would be as rich as Simon Cowell. But these verses aren't first and foremost about us. They involve us, ultimately, but they're not first and foremost about us. They are first and foremost about the apostles and about Jesus and about the objective fact that his achievements in the gospel will be heralded to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You twelve apostles, your word about me will be taken to the ends of the earth. The truth of Jesus, you can't stop it. You will be my witnesses. And that word witness is a technical word. It comes elsewhere in the Bible. It comes in Isaiah 43 and 44 where God announces that he will work mightily and then appoint key witnesses whose eyes he will open and who he will send to proclaim his achievements to the ends of the earth. So what is being established here is the objective truth that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to go to the ends of the earth, whether you like it or not, you might say. And that's the agenda of the book of Acts. Just come with me very briefly um, to some of the panel markers that divide Acts up. Chapter 6, verse 7. Chapter 6, verse 7. Remember, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Chapter 6, verse 7, the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to faith. Up to that point, the ministry is confined to Jerusalem and by 6, 7, the word of God has advanced right throughout Jerusalem. Chapter 9, verse 31. Remember, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria. Chapter 9, verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So the gospel had advanced from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. And then in the rest of the book, four other markers through Antioch, Asia Minor, out into Europe, and then right at the end to Rome itself and the ends of the world. So this verse 8 is, it involves us. It's not primarily about us. It is a straight announcement that this is what is going to happen across the world as the reign of Jesus is extended to all nations. Uh, I was going to use the image of a pebble at this stage. You know how, I, I don't know if this is a, a sort of, agenda thing or not, but you know how when you get to a pond, you cannot but heave a rock into the middle of it. Do you find that? No. Okay, well, it may, it may not even be a gender thing. It may just be a, a unique quirk to me, um, in wh which case I had most, most of uh, my children sort of growing up stage, having taught them to hurl rocks into the sea, was then taught the boys to, not to hurl rocks at bathers in the sea, because it's a big error to teach them to hurl rocks into the sea. But, you know when you hurl a rock into the, into the, into the pond, you know, there is a big bloosh, and then, or something like that, and then the ripples come out and come out, and then eventually there they are lapping at the side of the, uh, at the, side of the pond. But I don't think that's big enough. You know, this gospel advance of which Jesus is speaking is not a kind of little ripple on a pond. It's more of a tsunami. You cannot stop it. You will be my witnesses. The power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you twelve, and your witness will be taken from Jerusalem, to Judea, out into Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we began with, a, with, with you know, an A.N. Wilson who has since actually changed his mind. He wrote God's Funeral when he was going through a very cynical pe period. And a couple of Easter's ago, he wrote a book on, uh, he wrote an article on why Jesus definitely rose from the dead. So, but uh, here we are, A.N. Wilson. God's funeral, it, you know, it's like a small child. Stand, you'll go home, you'll watch the news, you'll see Mexico, the west, west, western coast, you'll see this huge, huge hurricane, and then picture a small child. Oh, stop, stop, stop. No chance. You can't stop it. And Ludovic Kennedy, you know, it's like, it's like, a, like a person standing on the Boxing Day tsunami. And say, oh, stop, stop. You, you can't stop it. It's going to go to the ends of the earth. And that is what we have seen. Certainly been my experience here in London, 
as the word of Jesus is taught, we see his gospel advance in all sorts of ways. You can't stop it. Um, this little church, I mean, you know, we're just, what are we, 500 people? We're not particularly significant. This little church, we just teach the gospel like this, Sunday by Sunday. And uh, over the years, we've seen works established here and there and somewhere else, and people sent over there proclaiming the gospel and the gospel advancing. And in spite of the secularists and the death of the institutional church in Britain, advance, 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 advance. You cannot stop it. God has appointed his witnesses. That truth stands there. There's a great boulder that has fallen into the center of history, and the ripples of it extend across the globe and you will never be able to stop it. And history has demonstrated that to be true. The star character, the core curriculum. And now if you're taking notes, the final act, and we've just got a couple of minutes left before I finish, verses 9 to 10, oh, I'm sorry, 9 to 11. The final act, dash for your notes, which this book does not record. Now that's really important. The final act, dash, not D-A-S-H, but, you know, a little, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the final act, which this book does not record. Now, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. That is a fulfillment of Daniel 7, where God's eternal king and ruler comes to God on the clouds for enthronement. So 4 verse 9, read, when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was enthroned. Death is conquered. He has risen from the dead. He's died for sin. He is enthroned as king and son of man. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So do you see the last two lines there? He will come in the same way as you saw him go. If I was to set you an exercise, how then will he come again? The answer is in verse 9. How did he go? On the clouds. How will he return? On the clouds, enthroned in glory, as the Son of Man, kingly ruler. Has that happened? No, it hasn't. And so what age of history do we live in? We live in the age of history of verse 8, of the gospel being proclaimed to the ends of the earth. For he has not yet returned unmistakably as final king and ruler to wrap this phase of the world's history up. He hasn't done that yet. And therefore, where do we live we live in the age of global advance of the gospel message of Jesus. Jesus, the star character, the global advance of the gospel, the core curriculum, his glorious return, the final act, which this book does not record. Therefore, where do we live? We live in the age of the global advance of the gospel. Proclaiming the clingly rule of Christ. You know, I said it's not about us, but it does involve us. Because we live in that age. And that means that, uh, you know, whatever you've come to London for, what is really going on in London is the global advance of the gospel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have arrived in London a bit like Dick Whittington you know, planning to make your fortune, the, road, the streets are paved with, they used to be paved with gold before the, the, the banking crisis, and Dick Wintington came up, didn't he, with, uh, didn't, he didn't come with rats, that was the Pied Piper, wasn't he? He came up with, you know, all his stuff in a handkerchief on, the, on his back, and, um, and he, you know, he became Lord Mayor of London, the streets were paved with, you may have come up thinking, that's what, he, future Lord Mayor, that's what I'm going to do, there's something much, much bigger going on, the global advance of the gospel, because we're in this final act. Or we're in this stage before the final, the final scene, the return of Christ. Uh, maybe you come, come to London, you're going to get a PhD in you know, um, mechanical engineering. You're going to invent the next sort of robot that will operate on us or, or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Yes, yeah, but there, there's something much, much bigger going on than you know, cutting me open and finding out what's going on inside with a robot. Something much, much greater, the global advance of the gospel is going on. You, you may have come back to London, as I think a, 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 one or two people I've spoken to over the last three weeks, 
you know, as an old timer, just slightly cynical. You know, you came up thinking you would achieve great things, and two or three years down the track, actually, slightly disillusioned. There's something much bigger to get involved in, the global advance. Something much bigger than the next series of X Factor. M much, much bigger than the great British Bake Off. Can you believe it? I find it hard to believe it. There's something much, much greater something much more full of hope and certainty than forlorn help, hopes, uh, attempts to engage in the Middle East or whatever it happens to be. Something really great. The extension of the kingdom of God through the proclamation of his kingly rule. Let's pray together. You will receive power. You will be my witnesses. We praise you that this objective truth, the reality of the rule of Jesus, is being proclaimed all over the world, and nobody has been able to stop it. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful benefit of having Jesus live within our heart, a fresh start and a new beginning with Jesus as King. And we pray that you would prevent us from kind of gazing into space and enable us to take our part in what you're doing in London. For your namesake. Amen.